looks like we've got everybody here, so I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Katati City Council and the successor agency to the former Katati Community Redevelopment Agency. Tonight is Tuesday, July 28th, 2020, and um, I will ask our city clerk if we could have a roll call, please. Councilmember DeLosa. Here. Councilmember Harvey. Here. Councilmember Landman. Here. Vice Mayor Moy. Here. Mayor Stillman. Here. Thank you. And if everybody could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, and to the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, and, liberty and, justice and justice for all. All right, so we'll move on to item four, approval of minutes <clears throat> Excuse me, from the regular meeting that we had on July 14th. Move to approve. This council member will also Harvey. go ahead and second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can I please get a roll call vote? Council member Delisto. Yes. Council member Harvey. Yes. Council member Landman. Yes. Vice Mayor Moore. Yes. Mayor Stillman. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to announcements. Meeting orientation for new attendees or viewers. In conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted City Council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the City Council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is a designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The city council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. <clears throat> However, if the city council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the city council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purpose purposefully biased. Measure G supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. Citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up at nixel.com or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888-777. It's our top priority to provide you with prompt and comprehensive customer service, and we continue to offer all city services. However, in the interest of public health, City Hall is currently closed to walk-in traffic due to the current health officer order. During this time, our services have temporarily transitioned to phone and web-based, as well as appointments by request. Staff continue to be available to answer your questions 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And like always, we love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact the city at 707-792-4600 or info at katadicity.org. If you have a non-emergency issue after normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media cha channels available on Facebook, Instagram, Nixle, and Nextdoor. So the first item we have this evening is a presentation. We'll turn it over to Chief Parrish to talk about <clears throat> the Mothers Against Drink Drunk Driving Award. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, um, Council members. Um, Please give me a moment here to take control of the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, it takes about a minute. Or hopefully less. There I 
go. So, uh, as the mayor said, it, uh, MAD is Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Um, this was a grassroots um, movement created in 1980 by a mom who lost a child uh, due to a drunk driver. And even though uh, statistically there's fewer drunk driving deaths in the United States um, because of MAD, um, we still have over 10,000 deaths annually in the United States due to impaired drivers. Um, so I'm happy to say that we have two officers for 2019. That's what these statistics are from, from the year 2019, to receive uh, the MAD award. And so I told these two officers that I was going to join them um, in Rockland because we're in the northern California region. I was supposed to physically join our officers for a luncheon in Rockland in April because of COVID that got pushed to uh, October uh, again in Rockland with, for the luncheon. But neither of those are going to happen. So our officers are going to receive their uh, MAD award this Friday via Zoom. So we are in the time of Zoom. Um, so in our city in 2019, um, Kentucky police officers are arrested 100 plus DUI offenders. A more accurate number is like 110. Um, and, and this is not always that simple. So some of these drivers weren't even drinking alcohol. Some were only impaired uh, by drugs. But then you had drivers that um, are impaired by both. And so if one of our officers finds an impaired driver, but their blood alcohol is extremely low, um, what they're going to do is want to examine uh, their blood or drugs. And if they don't consent, if the driver does not consent to that, um, the officers uh, must get a warrant from a judge to draw their blood to examine it. Um, and a lot of times this is, you know, this could be two or three in the morning when they're working on on getting a, uh, a warrant for a blood draw. So it can, it can become complicated at times. Uh, the officers have um, quite a bit of training to determine um, what type of drug you're on, whether it's an uh, opioid or stimulant, for example. Um, so there's just uh, a ton of training and science behind DUI these, these days. And so our awardees are Officer Anthony Garber and Officer Mohammed Ahmadi. Um, so on the MAD award criteria, larger law enforcement agencies need uh, 50 arrests to receive the award, and small law enforcement agencies need 25. Um, but regardless, you can't just have the arrest. You've got to have a conviction rate of 75% or higher, which our officers did. And if you're wondering about the threshold being lower for small, smaller agencies, it's part of what I talked about at our town hall meeting last week is um, officers at smaller agencies have to do everything, so including their own investigations. And um, I wanted to share that Officer Garber, besides doing investigation, general police work, he's assigned to uh, a to keeping track of our sex registrants in our city. Um, he's in charge of our evidence packaging station, and he's also in charge of pawn slips. Uh, Officer Hamadi is a cadet advisor, so cadet meaning our entry-level young people that volunteer at the police department. And then also Officer Hamadi is in charge of the preliminary alcohol screening device, and that's the device that's used to test your uh, blood alcohol level um, out on the vehicle stop. So he keeps that device calibrated. Uh, so they're busy officers, and uh, that's a lot of DUIs in a year. And I know that that's close to half of the DUI arrest, and that's for a few reasons. One, they work the later shifts, and two, they just seem to have um, a knack for this uh, type of investigation, arrest, and enforcement, and obviously conviction rate. 
And so when I talk about an award, they actually get a, a ribbon to wear on their uniforms that's given to them by MAD itself. And so that, that number on, on the end, that 23152, that is the California Vehicle Code section for impaired driving. And so soon they will receive that um, after Friday at some point when they officially get the award. So I wanted to share this with you. I don't think a lot of people know about this. This is a new assembly bill, uh, Assembly Bill 47 by Tom Daly in Orange County. Um, the bill takes effect July 21. So moving forward, anyone who is cited for distracted driving and has a previous conviction for distracted driving within 36 months will now get a DMV point on their driving record. So instead of a minimal fine, effective July of 21, um, distracted driving uh, citations are finally going to have some teeth. And I hope that this, um, I hope this has an impact on safety in California. Uh, because there are studies that distracted driving with cell phones um, is the equivalent sometimes of distracted driving, um, like using drugs and alcohol. And then so luckily we, we received an OTS grant for this uh, federal fiscal year. Uh, the grant is for uh, $28,000. We're going to use $15,000 of this in uh, DUI enforcement overtime. And we will assign the special days, um, days like the Super Bowl, uh, Sunday, uh, holidays. There's, there's a lot of um, parent drivers. We will, um, we will use that money where we think it's best, um, the best efficient way to use it to uh, find impaired drivers. And then the, uh, the remaining $13,000 will be uh, traffic enforcement for accident contributing factors. So those factors are speed, um, cell phone use, and things like that. And then as uh, council, as I promised in strategic planning, um, we will, uh, during this fiscal year, also be conducting um, pedestrian safety enforcement. So we will be um, doing surveillance on crosswalks and writing citations for people who do not yield um, to pedestrians. So all of this is just uh, the police department's um, commitment to keep drivers, bicyclists, and pedestrians safe in our city. And uh, Mayor, that that is um, my presentation. And I thank you for the opportunity. No, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Chief Parrish. It's great to hear we've got so many active officers uh, involved in keeping your streets safe. So thank you for the presentation. Um, next, we'll move on to item B, which is a second presentation we have tonight, um, an informational presentation on the issuance of successor agency to the Katati Redevelopment Agency Tax Allocation Refunding Bonds, Series 2020A. And for this, I will turn it over to Angela Corder. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council Members, fellow staff, and members of the public. So tonight, I am going to be reporting out to you a brief presentation on the issuance and finalization for the successor agency tax allocation bond refunding and also restructuring. So just this May, the successor agency also uh, authorized the issuance and sale of the tax allocation refunding for both the 2001 and 2004 RDA bonds. So the bonds had a combined outstanding balance of just over $8 million with an interest rate of just over 5%. At the time of the approval, staff anticipated that an interest rate would be reduced to just below 3% and would provide a savings of just over uh, $1.63 million. Due to these savings projections, the Department of uh, Finance 
for California approved the issuance on July 1st, and we went out for uh, private funding for these bonds. So the best offer we had for our interest rate was came from J.P. Morgan Chase with a reduced rate of 1.29% um, from our municipal advisors. This is the lowest rate they have ever seen. Um, so this was a reduction of over 3.74% from our average 5.03% on these bonds which contributed to a cash flow savings of over $2.64 million over the life of the bond. And also due to the restructuring of these bonds, we were able to move those savings forward to these next three years, where we will be able to recapture approximately one, almost $2 million through fiscal year 21-22, and the remainder will have some trickle savings through the completion of the bond in 20. 35. So the present value of the savings, so the total overall of the bond, we're saving approximately 23% over the bond. So compared to where we reported out to you when this was authorized to go out for financing, we anticipated the original estimate of the city's share of the savings would be approximately $300,000. With this reduced interest rate, we're actually going to see an improvement of almost $200,000, giving us an actual savings of $492,844 over the life of the bond. Um, overall, for all taxing entities, we had an improvement of over a million dollars. So just to show you how this allocation was, going to benefit each one of the taxing authorities. You can see that we are just below the school districts where we have that benefit of approximately $500,000, um, where they are definitely the highest sharing savings and have the highest benefit of the $1.2 million. So this bond was completed today, um, and everything's issued and finalized, and we're going to get the rest of the final paperwork in shortly. Um, but that's all my presentation. Just wanted to share uh, the great news. Thank you, Angela. That's fantastic news about the savings, especially long term. So thank you very much for making that happen. OK, so with that, we'll move on to item seven, approval of the final agenda. I'll ask our uh, city manager, are there any changes to the agenda tonight? Thank you, Mayor. No proposed changes. Okay, great. So we'll move on to item eight, which is citizens business and public comment for consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to the city council policy 2017-2, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda, and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for a reasonable time where a disability accommodation has been requested. With that, I will turn it over to our city clerk to check in with our attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. For our attendees tonight, uh, to make a public comment, just use the raise hand icon on your smart device or desktop computer, or dial star nine if you're using just your telephone. Listen carefully for the mayor or myself to address you by name or phone number and for the audible Zoom notification that you've been unmuted. Once you begin your public comment, your three minutes will begin. Ms. Alderman, go ahead. Um, first, I didn't get to, um, you didn't call public comment on the two presentations. i like to make a, a short comment on the bond one. So that should be um, done into my citizens business time but okay so with the bonds you've put all the, the savings
savings are all in the next three years, which is setting up the city for um, once Measure G, G um, in 20, it, it'll, you have a double whammy coming up um, with having both Measure G and the savings going, it's, these bonds are not good for our future in the long term. Um, yes, they're great news in the, but any restructuring in this economy would have had great savings. Um, it, it really needs to be looked at why you got, have to have the three um, years. Um, um, Lori, can you stop the clock so I can go on to um, consent? Consent. Okay, consent to the calendar. The um, I only have one item on that. Why are you canceling your August meeting? Um, because it's historically right. That's what you historically do. Where are you going on vacation? We are still in the middle of a pandemic. The city hall is not opening, and you want to skip another meeting? I'm fine with Christmas, but we're still in a pandemic, people. Okay, that's my citizen com comment on the that, and I'd like to leave it all open that if anybody else speaks, um, I speak on basic citizens business afterwards. Okay, thank you. Mr. Barrett, go ahead. Lauren, it looks like he's still muted. Okay, you there now? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, George Barrett, former City Council member. Uh, on the previous issue of the bond restructuring and the new refinancing, I don't think it's all great news, and I'll tell you why. First of all, the need, uh, the need for the bond savings is going to have to take place, and it makes sense to restructure the bond. But Katani is going to be expecting a lot less revenue coming into this city in the next few years. So any savings from the bonds and the interest on the bonds is going to be offset by the decline in business, the de decline in pandemic uh, ramifications, decline in, in employment, decline in tourism in Katadi, and if we go back to when the bonds were first structured, the police station was like $5 million cost. Added to that was the $1 million set aside we spent for the um, downtown specific plan and the charrettes. The other $900,000 was for the remodel of the Katadi room. The total bond amount was $6.9 million. That money financed over 30 years, principal and interest came to $28 million. Many argued that was too much money for a small town of 7,000 and that it was wasted money, that that money could have been spent elsewhere in the city. It has led to businesses um, have, having a loss of faith in the city and so forth put the city in a terrible bind to have to try to raise taxes, measure A, measure G, with all the false promises that went along with uh, those campaigns for, do for dollars. Now you're saying it's a great news to have the, the bond refinanced. It's not all great news. We're in a mess. Katadi's in a mess because of the Taj Mahal police station you, you built that we didn't have money for. Most cities save over time for a new police station. They save for new city halls. They save for parks, but not Katani. We borrowed money over time, and it cost us a fortune, a fortune. But although the bond savings right now seems like good news, 
it's not great news. Thank you. Mayor Stillman, that'll be it for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll also remind um, folks that there's a public comment on non-action agenda items later on as well, so you can come back to anything you may have missed. So let's move on to item nine, um, the consent calendar. Mayor Skillman, this is Council Member Harvey. I move to approve. And this is Council Member Landman. I'll second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Can we please get a roll call vote? Council Member Delasso? Yes. Council Member Harvey? Yes. Council Member Landman? Yes. Vice Mayor Moore? Yes. Mayor Stillman? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to item number 10, direction on feature agenda items. And for that, I will look to my council members, see if anybody wants to put a hand up with an idea for a future agenda item this week. All right, I'm not seeing any rushes to raise a hand, so I will assume we're good on that item. And we will move on to our regular agenda, item 11A. And for that, I will turn it over to Damien to talk about the enhanced public education potential civil compliance tools to enforce the county health order. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So um, as way of a little background, I think it's pretty fre fresh in everyone's minds, but um, on July 10th, 11th, and 12th this year, Sonoma County recorded daily case counts of COVID-19 exceeding the limits set forth by the state public health officer and state of health officials, which resulted in the um, placement on the watch list and the closure of certain businesses and indoor operations for a period of not less than three weeks. Additionally, on July 13th, the governor announced that certain businesses and indoor operations that promote the mixing of populations beyond households must close statewide and that Sonoma County must close indoor operations such as gyms, places of worship, offices for non-critical businesses, personal care services, and malls. This is the so-called so second um, shutdown. And then prior to the state orders, Sonoma County's COVID-19 infection rates doubled in a matter of months, and hospitalizations and deaths uh, have tragically continued to climb. And these statistics reveal a need to enhance education and outreach efforts as well as enforcement to incentivize compliance to protect community health and local businesses from additional closures. The, um, this resulted in a, in a uh, a discussion with the Board of Supervisors uh, meeting, the special meeting on July 23rd, and um, the staff report, county staff report, and the presentation that was provided to the Board of Supervisors is in the packet. And um, the recommendations of the county staff basically fall into three categories. First being enhanced education and outreach. So um, they wanted to expand what they um, but they already they have an existing safe Sonoma summer campaign that they had already um, been moving forward on. But they, the board of supervisors in the July twenty third meeting, um, directed staff to expand that to include English and Spanish infographics, videos, radio, print, public service announcements, media communications, and website building um, to further the public education mission, as well as the addition of two new public information staff for up to twenty weeks. And, um, and then going along with that is, um, and this came out of some um, more discussions regionally with the cities and the county, is um, centralizing a uh, reporting hotline for violations of the health order. So this would be an email or a phone line that would be available countywide and would triage any received complaints. And um, they would be uh, triaged and then sent to the responsible jurisdiction. Um, so both of those items were um, approved by the Board of Supervisors to implement essentially immediately. So, um, you know, we do, uh, we are expecting some ramped up public education and outreach work in the county as well as uh, the establishment of a centralized hotline. The staff at this meeting were also seeking 
direction from the Board of Supervisors on uh, new compliance tools. And um, basically what they were looking for is uh, direction to move forward on a uh, on an urgency ordinance, which would come back to the Board of Supervisors on August 6th. And um, as, again, as a way of background, what basically how the county health order is enforced now is through a criminal misdemeanor, and that's only um, only police officers are able to issue those types of citations. And um, if they are issued to a business, then they are um, referred to the district attorney for possible prosecution. Um, while this is the enforcement uh, tool that's been available to date, um, education continues and will continue to be the primary means of trying to um, get people to comply with the requirements and protect public health. Um, it has the discussion at the Board of Supervisors were that it would be it would be advantageous to um, you know to ensuring public health to have more tools available and also um, you know also in, in in view of the fact that we had to do a partial reshutdown due to the um, increase in cases. So clearly there's need for additional education and tools. So the proposal that was um, discussed between the staff and the Board of Supervisors was adding, in addition to the criminal misdemeanor tool that's already available, adding a um, civil infraction tool. So this is, an infraction is basically a civil fine, kind of like a parking ticket. It doesn't go to the DA for prosecution. It's really processed um, like a ticket would be. And um, the other benefit of an infraction is that it does not have to be issued by a police officer. So a police officer, of course, could issue an infraction, but it opens it up to other um, non-law enforcement staff, so like code enforcement officials, um, park rangers on the county side, for example. And so um, at that meeting on the 23rd, staff got direction from the Board of Supervisors. You add three new code enforcement officials to the effort, um, two new administrative staff to support them, and enlist the existing park rangers into um, the program. And the Board of Supervisors also directed county staff to come back with an urgency ordinance on August 6th. So this would be um, an urgency ordinance, basically, I think, as you all know, means that the ordinance would be effective upon adoption. So there wouldn't be the normal, um, you know, two readings and 30 days after. So it would be effective immediately, essentially, on August 6th if it's approved by the supervisors. Um, at this time, we don't know a lot about that, about, about the urgency ordinance, and, um, you know, we do know that the, uh, that the county wants to um, coordinate enforcement in addition to the hotline that they've already um, been directed to establish. They're, they have um, expressed an interest, as I understand it, in um, coordinating closely with the state's task force. The state established a, a, a compliance task force and um, and also uh, coordinating with the local jurisdictions. Um, and in terms of how the infraction tickets could be um, issued, they could be issued under the county ordinance, is my understanding, or they, um, the local jurisdictions could create their own ordinance. And um, there's some mechanics questions there as to how those tickets would be issued under, you know, whose ticket books would be used that would need to be um, uh, figured out still because we haven't seen the draft we haven't seen what the county is proposing to bring forward. We've seen an initial draft of the emergency ordinance, um, but we haven't seen what the county is planning to take forward. So, once the once the county um, has a draft final, and I think they've been mostly working amongst the um, city attorneys and the county council on drafting that emergency ordinance. Once that is pretty close to final, then um, then we'll have a better idea of sort of where the points of interaction are and um, any questions. But the, uh, in addition to just a general informational update to the council and the community, uh, this item also is, um, is requesting direction from the council to the staff to, uh, to review the urgency ordinance the county puts forward and provide recommendations to the council on, um, on if, we, um, if we were in Katati to use uh, either the county's infraction or um, uh, our own infraction or 
uh, nothing at all. So basically directing staff to um, to evaluate what the county puts forward and make recommendations at the August 11th City Council meeting. And then um, one more thing I just will say about the infractions is they did set the, um, you know, at least in the in the um, discussion on the 23rd, they were talking about setting commercial citations at a, this is the infractions, at $1,000 and non-commercial at $100 per um, per citation. This um, this can be variable. I mean, there's other there are other counties around us, Marin County, Mendocino County, Napa County, that have um, adopted infraction ordinances, and they have um, varying amounts, varying fine amounts. And um, that table is in the PowerPoint that was attached to the staff report that the county provided. And um, the county was recommending that it's a flat, kind of a flat fee um, for the citation rather than any sort of sliding scale that some other places use to keep it um, simple and straightforward. Um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I'll bring it back to council and see if there are any questions. Um, yes, council member Harvey, go ahead. So in the staff report, it said that um, in the financial considerations that there was none at this time. But when I look at the um, presentation done by the county, they talk about um, having a compliance team and they talk about basically five new staff at a cost of $350,000 to $450,000. But it specifically mentions that it's for the unincorporated area only. So my question is, it sounds like there's an expectation that we in our cities would also have compliance teams. So can you speak to that a little bit? So I think um, it probably would entail some some closer coordination between our law enforcement in the county um, and also potentially our code enforcement in the county, but um, but it wouldn't necessarily be a change in our practice, you know, and how we um, go about educating the community and um, and even enforcing. Other than it, if if we were to um, use an infraction tool, it would just be another option available to try to gain compliance rather than going straight to a criminal misdemeanor. So our intention from a city perspective, at least at this point, is to not add any additional staff to um, keep people in compliance. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't a uh, we don't think there's a need to add additional staff. It's really just, um, you know, it gives it gives our code enforcement officer the ability to issue citations as well as the police um, at an administrative level rather than it being a, you know, misdemeanor that gets referred to the DA. Thank you. Okay, and I see uh, Councilmember DeLasso. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Uh, Damien, uh, the one question I had, because I, I don't remember if I read this in the report related to Sonoma, for it was for another location, but was there any discussion <clears throat> with, um, and I guess I'm going to call it a sliding scale, but specifically towards additional infraction by the same individual or business? I guess I'm not remembering that that was in there or not. Yeah, I don't believe so. I think it's a it's a flat citation amount or violation, and usually that's viewed as like each typically it's like each day violation. Yeah, and, and you know, looking at some of the other rates in the in the presentation that was attached, um, they, they seem to be all over the map, and some of them have a slide from you know twenty five dollars to five hundred dollars. It's quite the gap there, and um, I, I guess the uh, I don't know if we're too late in the game to make a suggestion to the board, but you know, or to the county to bring to the board. But is that hundred dollar fine not an incentive enough 
for some of the people who continue to defy not wearing a mask and, and some of the other issues that are out there, you know, should it be a little heftier? And if it's going to be the same amount per infraction, then I would be interested in seeing that being slightly higher. I, I don't have a recommendation right now. I'm open to it, but I think, um, you know, a hundred dollars is, is a chunk of money, but I don't know that it's incentive enough to get some people to wear a mask. Yeah, I think the, um, so the hundred dollars of course is for non-commercial, um, there right. probably wouldn't be a lot of those kind of citations, generally speaking. I mean, um, you know, it typically tends to be more commercial related, um, from our experience so far. And, um, it, it can add up fast. And, you know, the, um, the discussion that's been going on is, is, uh, you know, if you, if you're issuing administrative citations to, um, like say a business of some type, because they're out of compliance and it's a public health issue, um, you know, once you've been sort of issuing them citations for a bit, um, then at some point, if they're just not, if you're not gaining compliance, then um, at some point it could become criminal misdemeanor and the DA gets involved and, you know, it, th that's sort of the escalation of, you know, a, of a case where, and, that, and that's pretty rare. I mean, there's, there's a handful in the county that have happened, you know, where they've escalated to the point where it's been a criminal misdemeanor and then even a lawsuit in the county. And it was like in Santa Rosa, for example, there was an example there and um, a couple others elsewhere in the county. Right. So it's really the escalation route that I think is the compliance, um, the, the thought around how to gain compliance if people are just unwilling to um, do it on, on their own. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'll have some other thoughts after public comment, but um, I was just trying to clear that up. Thank you for that. Okay, and I see uh, Councilmember Lamon. You've got your hand up, so please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Yeah, I share my colleague's concern about that. I, I do think that might have changed since the staff report was written. It's a little difficult to tell, parse from the press Democrat story, but if you read it, it mentions that the county staff would have the authority to issue citations for businesses that would be on a sliding scale from 500 to 10,000. And they mention that's 10 times greater than initially proposed by staff. And I won't read the rest of it, but I think that matches much closer to what Mendocino, Napa, and, and other cities, YOLO, are doing. So I suspect, and I'm hopeful that it sticks because I think it was necessary too. So I think they're moving in that direction. I guess we'll know for sure on August 2nd, but I just thought it was worthy to point that out because that is an important thing. I think the initial proposed flat fee just isn't going to do it. You have to have something that's more realistic uh, that works as a tool to motivate that small percentage that will be scoff laws and repeat offenders. And I think with rates as proposed matching with some of the other counties that are ahead of us and have already done this, those will tend to do that motivation. Okay, thank you. I see uh, Vice Mayor Moore. You've got your hand up, so please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Um, although I had hoped that we wouldn't be here at this point in time, obviously we are. And I think if we do look at something uh, uh, that allows us to not necessarily keep it uh, at the control of the police department and freeze them up and, and enforcement officers could take care of this, I would think that this would be uh, a step forward and hopefully we can uh, have some consistency with the county if, and what their program is if it's not too out of line. I didn't really have a question. I just kind of had a statement on that one. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so with that, I will open it up for public comments. So I'll ask uh, our city clerk to check in with our attendees. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. And to any new attendees listening, use the raise hand icon on your smart device or desktop computer, or dial star nine if you're just using your telephone. Ms. Olderman, go ahead. Um, on 
I don't know if any of you were listening to the Runa Park um, Council meeting right before this, but they had a, a, a lively discussion about this. Um, they said the county is not communicating with the nine cities and at all, and all the mayors are upset and all that, and they don't want it to be where certain cities have different um, levels of compliance, um, like everybody would go to Katati because we didn't reinforce it. Um, and especially Rona Park wanted to um, work with Katati, so I think you guys need to really start talking to the, so, and but it sounded like the county is totally out of whack with what the cities want, so I think a lot of these questions will be, um, Will be answered by the when they figure out with the county. Um, I, and I just wanted to tell you tell a story about enforcement and things like that. Um, my mom grew up in World War II in England near a um, bomb factory, and um, they were they were they were almost nightly bombed. Well, um, if somebody left on a light, the community would, um, um, you know, of course, chastise them for it, but they also get a major fine from their city, um, from the, you know, the town, for endangering this, the, um, the well health and welfare of the city. And I mean, this, that's an extreme example, but I think we do need to and have some kind of enforcement and fines. So that's just my opinion. Okay, that's it. Thanks. There's no one that appears. There's no other public comment. Okay. Well, thank you for your comments, um, and I will bring it back to council. See if there are any further comments um, or direction. And so I see Council Member Landman, you got your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I, I think it's clear that this is the price that we pay, uh, us as a county, the state, really the whole country, as we can see right now, for the kind of open up frenzy that we went through. I think some of us knew at the time that this was too early and too quick. And I think hopefully now a lot more of us recognize that fact. And unfortunate as it is, I think there's one small benefit. At least it's clear now that we all have to take this a lot more seriously. And I think part of that is getting serious about a coordinated approach to have better enforcement of the safety rules. Uh, endangering, somebody mentioned, that is a perfect term. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, and I think by ensuring compliance, we help protect everybody's safety. So that's... I think that's just what we should be doing. And I definitely agree if we could have consistency, good consistency based on science in the county, that would be important. Uh, so I'm definitely supportive of either following with our own urgency ordinance or using the counties, whichever works best, uh, with the goal of consistency, but following the best science in the county. Um, and I do hope to see buy-in this time from the sheriff's office. I think that's going to be important, too, so I will cross my fingers for that. But my direction would be to support this strongly. Uh, I think we're all a little late in getting there, so it's important we do it now. Okay, thank you. I see um, Councilmember DeLasso as well. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Yeah, it, um, you know, the collective we... Um, have been doing education to the public as the science has evolved on this, because that's their science. It does evolve and you learn. Um, and education hasn't been as effective for a minority people that are out there. And a few defiant ones that are out there that a fine would or might be more effective tool. Um, and I coordinated approach countywide is the best thing to do. We can't have, you know, we've talked about this with things like plastic bag bans and so on. When you're trying to do something 
you you need to have a much more coordinated effort and not just you know nine or ten different options for something like this in the county of Sonoma with the nine cities in the county. So um, I would strongly agree with that. And um, I, I, yeah, I think that's uh, really, it's kind of simple, um, but I say that we do push forward on this and um, I, I'm gonna relax from the figures and not come up with any figures, but um, it's a starting point for now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Harvey. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Skillman, I know yourself um, attends um, weekly meetings with the other mayors in the county on this, so I don't know. It was mentioned that, that um, this hasn't been discussed, but I, I think that you guys meet on this weekly. I know that um, Damien sits in on some city manager and county calls um, on this. So I think there is um, collaboration going on. Maybe it sounds like not as much as um, everyone would wish. Um, and having sat on enough of the countywide committees and JPAs and things we have that, you know, they aren't always as smooth as we all want them to be. We ultimately seem to get there, um, but um, we do definitely have highs and lows in getting ourselves there. Um, I, I view this as you know no different um, than any of the other things that we work together on as a county. I think that we um, are better when we work together and come up with solutions because our people you know, don't just stay within our cities. They go all over the county. Not too different than, you know, you see across the country where some of these other uh, states, which are the size of, you know, some of our cities, um, are working together to um, come up with things because they know that their people um, don't stay in one place, that they work one place and their kids go to school one place and so on and so forth. So. Um, I think it's good that we're trying to get a consistent message out. And I think that, um, you know, fines are there when we can't get compliance, but I do believe that, you know, having a consistent message and getting that education, which I know that um, most of our officers have been trying to do, um, is to educate people. I think that that's the key. And yes, you will get people that will just not be compliant because they, you know, for whatever reason, there's lots of reasons out there. All you have to do is go out on the internet. But anyways, um, I think education is key. And sometimes you have to use that stick to um, get people moving in the right direction. So thank you, Mayor. No, thank you. And um, oh, yes, Vice Mayor Moore, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Scullin. Um I just wanted to comment on the meeting regarding the mayors and council members. I did um, fill in last Friday for Mayor Skillman, and conversation did come up with the representatives of the cities and uh, Supervisor Boren. Um, and we are looking to get a, uh, a concerted plan in place so that uh, it is consistent with the county. So. Um, they had, there was no decisions made at that meeting, just a conversation regarding that and working with the county to come up with that. Um, so that's in the works. Uh, I would imagine we would see something sooner than later before their next meeting uh, to talk about what that's going to look like. But I would support um, a, a greater um, incentive to comply uh, with the um, concerns right now. So I would be in support of something that, again, is consistent with the county. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, yes, and we do have our weekly mayor's meeting, which has started since the shutdown. And um, it's been a great tool for making sure we all have the same information, um, 
communicate with each other about what's going on in our own cities as well as what's affecting the county as a whole. Um, so that's been very beneficial. And um, I appreciate you, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Moore, stepping in last week. I was definitely in no shape to attend last Friday. So i um, glad that you could step in. And um, I agreed to, with um, my fellow council members, that education, outreach, um, consistent messaging is all very important um, and really just to try to turn this thing around and um, I think it's a, a good option that we're talking about doing an infraction because um, obviously to go from zero to misdemeanor is a little bit um, harsh especially when it could be a first time in infraction uh, or well, there I'm making a pawn without even meaning to, but if it's the first time that somebody's been in non-compliance, then um, it's better to at least have that option. And then also being able to uh, provide backup for our law enforcement officers, um, just providing more tools in the uh, toolbox, as they say. So anyhow, hopefully that's enough direction uh, for staff. And um, I can also do a... Uh, follow-up uh, email after this coming Friday's meeting um, on the subject so that I can keep everybody in the loop as to what the Board of Supervisors is, is planning. Um, so is that enough, uh, City Manager Obed? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. That's perfect. Got it. Okay, great. So with that, we will move on to item B, the Local Revenue Extension Measure. And for that, we will turn again to City Manager Obed. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. So um, since the voters approved Measure G, the City has used this to, um, to adequately staff our police department. We added a traffic officer assignment to improve traffic safety throughout the city. We added a new maintenance worker to improve maintenance of our public infrastructure. We restored the recreation programming, and we invested uh, to date $4.3 million restoring our streets, parks, and public buildings. And um, just by virtue of having um, a guaranteed source of local revenue, the city is able to also leverage that to bring in, to date, an additional $3.6 million in grants to improve, um, to improve the community. And the details of all the expenditures, as, um, as you know, are contained in Treasure Chief reports, which are reviewed by the Citizens Oversight Committee and, um, and are posted on the city's website. In recent surveys of Katati residents that were completed a year, over a year ago in January 2019, and then earlier this year in March, and most recently um, we followed up in June and July of this year as we reported back at the prior council meeting. Maintaining the local police department and 911 dispatch, uh, natural disaster preparedness, fiscal stability, and street repair continue to be the top priorities of the community. And the continuation of this vital local funding will have a significant impact on the city's ability to provide the level of services, emergency preparedness, infrastructure that the Tati residents expect and rely on. So, um, you know, if, without a continued guaranteed source of locally controlled revenue, the city would have to make drastic cuts, including the uh, likely elimination of our police department, contracting with, and probably contracting with the county or some other police entity elimination of the recreation department and all the programs, elimination of staff and public works, including support staff, um, and completely defund nearly all park, public building, and street maintenance projects. This would revert services to the bare minimum to function as a city, reverse the progress made with voter approved measure G funding, and allow city infrastructure to fall into disrepair, which will only be far costlier to repair later. Um, the proposed ordinance that's in the packet is um, an extension measure, so there is no um, change in taxes. It's merely extending the local revenue measure until um, until repealed by voters. If the attached resolution is adopted, the extension measure would be placed on the November 3rd, 2020 general election for for the voters and all other aspects would remain the same. So that would include annual audits of the funding as well as the Independent Citizen Oversight Committee would continue to review expenses annually and a public meeting and report those to the Council. Approval of this item requires an affirmative vote of two-thirds of 
the city council, so 405, and, um, and then subsequent approval by the majority of the voters at the November 3rd, 2020 election. And um, despite much progress since the passage of Measure G, the city of Katati still has a backlog of millions of dollars in street and sidewalk repair projects and park projects um, that you're all familiar with from the street master plan and also the park master plan. And they need to, um, they need to be addressed. The street projects and sidewalk projects in particular need to be addressed for the safety of all residents and the park projects just for the quality of life in the community. If the measure is not extended, Almost all infrastructure work will stop as, as it will no longer be financially feasible. As I mentioned, coupled with dramatic reduction in services, including, again, including the elimination um, of our local police department and the recreation department, and significant service reductions in public works and across all city departments. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that there um, that there is a cost to run an election, but um, this is a uh, this is a a regular council election cycle, so that um, the funding for that has already been appropriated in the adopted budget. And um, a measure like this uh, can um, can generally only be placed on a um, on a regular um, election where a city council member city council seat is up for up for uh, election, so even even years for Katati. Um, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. So first I'll bring it back to Council, see if there are any questions. Um, and I see Councilmember Lane, then you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I get some of the things you described. The hits, like the loss, potential loss of the police department, Definite loss of recreation, reductions in public works, uh, defunding of parks, any street maintenance. I, I get that because we actually lived through that together almost a decade ago. But one other item that isn't as severe but is still important I wanted to ask you about. We mentioned that we do have still a lot of millions of dollars in street and sidewalk repair projects that we want to do for the safety and improvement of the town. But what's not mentioned here is what the ongoing costs are in deferred maintenance with roads. Because we know if you let roads get bad, they're real expensive. Like I've heard numbers of up to seven times more cost to take care of it. We see some bigger cities or even the county, they get behind in this and they can almost never catch up where we've actually managed to get ahead of them in the last four years. I know it's hard to ask right off the cuff like this, but you can give me even a rough estimate of what sort of savings eventually we could get to on an annual basis for the public by being able to stick with that road work and getting our roads to a point where they only need minor annual maintenance? Well, um, so we every uh, every couple of years we do the pavement management planning process, and um, that's uh, that's um, it started off by a visual inspection, basically a rating of all of our streets, and so they assess the current condition, and then they um, put together a plan to repair the pavement or maintain the pavement, and that that's what generates the uh, the cost, you know, over the time horizon of the pavement management plan. I I don't have a I don't have a uh, a specific estimate, but I can tell you that right now, um, even continuing to do the paving work that we already have programmed, um, it's still, you know, millions of dollars. And if you basically stop doing all paving work for, you know, even one year, and, you know, every year you add to that, it's going to probably add, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars more in cost, ultimately, because the streets basically um, pass the inflection point where they um, can't be preserved with maintenance pipe treatments, they have to be basically totally reconstructed, which is, as you said, something like seven times more expensive than just doing maintenance treatments. So it's a really inefficient use of of our community's um, resources to to let things get to that point and basically have to rebuild them. Um, you're essentially building new roads at that point rather than just maintaining the roads you have. Yeah, I appreciate and that's actually a pretty good estimate. That's, that's helpful because you can see that 
say roughly 200k a year, it doesn't take that long to start getting to some pretty serious numbers. Um, so I think of all the concerns that could happen with a loss of funding to keep Katati going forward, this may be one of the more minor ones, but it was, I still wanted to bring it up because I think it should be listed on there because that's something we as a community had hoped to turn the corner on. I know a lot of people out in the public really liked that, and it would be a shame, it would be a shame from my perspective at least to see that go away. So, so thanks for that information. That's helpful to me. Okay, and I'm not seeing any more hands for uh, any questions. Um, I, I was just going to comment quickly, though, too. I, I do appreciate that this keeps at least a portion of the sales tax just in Katadi. Nobody else can take it, which I think is fantastic. Um, so anyway, with that, I will open it up to public comment and uh, ask our city clerk to check in with the attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stillman. Ms. Alderman, go ahead. In this presentation I've heard, not one of you are mentioning a couple things. Why we're having this, res where you need to put the vote on for November, it on November when it doesn't expire until um, 2023. Um, and why you made it a permanent one instead of having it sunset say another nine years and then these and you won't answer my emails to find out what how it can be how this could even happen and you've written the resolution so that um it doesn't mention that the effects are not um, um you make it sound in all the resolution that the effects are immediate they are not immediate they happen in 2023 when it sunsets, and you need to be very honest with this. With the, this has all been misleading. We didn't even know about this coming up, other than Kevin Fixler's articles in the that sales tax was coming up. We hear this last Friday that you want to put it on the November ballot in the middle of a pandemic, in an economic complex you're given no reason why it has to be in this november um other than you were taking advantage of the pandemic and the economic collapse who knows how many people are going to have to move or change places or change you know how this this election is going to be affected you should be delaying this at least till next year um what, closer to the, it's there's still plenty of time um, to do that, to um, put this on and have adequate and normal, or normal to the extent we can, a proper input. You're taking advantage of the situation to have it put it on this November one. It is absolutely horrible what you want to do and lock us in for eternity, basically, so that you can pay your salaries. Okay, that's it. Mr. Barrage, go ahead. Lori Alderman is correct again. It is absolutely horrible what you're trying to do here. The city council 10 years ago promised that Measure G would sunset. It went all around telling the public it's going to set sunset. We need these temporary funds to help the police and so forth. And it was all a big lie. I told people it was a big lie. That once these people get a hold of your taxes, God knows what you're going to do with them. You talk about the safety of the residents. You people have never cared about the safety of, of the residents. We see this by the way that you you have neglected street repairs for over a decade. City manager Obid had said when he was city engineer, the Toddy can't possibly repair and replace the streets at the rate that they are de deteriorating. That's a direct quote. You've been trying to play catch up, and then for a couple of years you didn't hardly pay anything on road repairs, and now you're trying to stack the deck right now to put the tax back on the ballot. If you want less of something, 
He attacks it. That's economics 101. If you want less economic activity for Qatar, you go ahead and you raise the taxes. And watch commerce leave, watch tourism leave, watch our local residents go to neighboring, neighboring towns where they can get a sales tax uh, reduction and so forth. You also said that uh, Measure G was only a half percent sales tax increase, when in fact, both newspapers reported that it was a full one percent sales tax increase. So you lied there. And the, and the community caught you in that lie. You said it was to save the police. It didn't save any of the police. All it did is was make, make Chief Parrish's retirement and his salary packages uh, huge and grotesque. That's all it did. It didn't put any more police officers on the street. We still only have one or two officers on patrol at any one time, if we're lucky. You squandered the Measure G money. The, re the revenue that did come in did not even come, come close to what could have come in had, had Measure G failed. Katadi would have seen enormous sales tax, sales tax activity and more commerce in Katadi had it not slammed over the head the consumers of Katadi with Measure G. I say give the local merchants a fighting chance to survive in this town after what you've done to them, plus the pandemic. A permanent tax increase will be the death of this town. Don't go there. You've already lied. You're gonna, you've been caught on it, and the public's going to know about it soon enough if you go down this road. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll bring it back to council to see if there's any follow-up comments. Um, and just to clarify as well, this isn't raising any taxes. This is maintaining the current sales tax that we have until the voters decide to repeal it. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Councilmember DeLasso. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Stillman. Um, <clears throat> and that is uh, that was my first point as well, is that this is an extension of an existing tax um, so it's not the adding of a tax and again tonight all that we're talking about is about letting our citizens vote yes or no whether they want this and it's clearly stated in there um, I'm, I keep hearing that it's we're, we're lying to everybody but it's clearly stated that this will be only can be repealed by another vote by the citizens well that's, that's pretty obvious what that really means. The money stays here. That is beyond critical. We won't be seeing any money grabs from the state or the county or the, anybody. Um, Mr. Barrich did mention your taxes. I guess he was speaking to the proverbial um, audience of Qatari citizens saying that your taxes will, you know, we're taking your money. Well, the city's not taking tax money from its citizens alone. This is a sales tax measure. Sales tax is based on sales. And being the hub of Sonoma County, I know many people who live south, north, east, and west of Katadi who do some level of purchasing of items or services here in Katadi. So it's we're not taxing Katadi citizens, we're taxing anybody who spends money in Katadi, which includes a lot of non-Katadi citizens. Uh, he um, also stated, I'm just trying to get some facts in here, that um, we've not we've not done anything but increased the salary of one employee in our police department. I think if you look at the FTE before Measure G was passed for the police department and you look at their FTE now, you'll see that we have more police officers. That was one of the things that we said this money would go towards, and indeed it has. And um, I, I just, um, I appreciate what Ms. Alderman was saying, uh, certainly related to the pandemic and that the, the timing is not right. I, I get that at some level, but I, here's my, my take on this too. Um, if people don't spend money, 
because they may be temporarily, we hope, out of work, not long-term out of work, but they're not spending money because they don't have the income due to the pandemic. But what that means is there's actually less tax revenue that's coming to the city. So I guess I don't see harm to the citizens because if they're not out there spending money in Katadi, then the tax doesn't apply in that specific instance. So I think that's a point that needs to be clarified. And I'm just trying to clarify that. So, um, and I will uh, certainly go on board to uh, whatever the majority of our citizens wish. And in this case, we're giving them the opportunity like we have with so many other things, with things like Sonoma Clean Power. And I mean, it, the list is huge. Um, the toxics in our parks not being sprayed anymore. We're going to give this decision to the citizens, and that's what I had for this evening, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, I see Councilmember Lamb, and you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Yeah, I'll start off with just a few corrections to the record here. It was mentioned that we had not perhaps put anything into improving roads or infrastructure in Katahdin. And actually, I'm kind of surprised to hear that. I think any of us who live in the town and drive around here have seen for the last four or five years an awful lot of work. As a matter of fact, you can see right in the staff report, about $4.3 million in roads and sidewalks in the last few years since Measure G's got up to speed and actually been able to contribute to allow that. So it's important to point out it's doing what we promised it would. It was something that people wanted. Uh, same thing with the police department. I do remember the discussions in those days. We went down to 10 or was it nine? We went, I believe that might've been nine. We were low in officers and that's sworn officers, not including dispatch and others. Now we're at 12 or 13, I believe, uh, without pulling the budget up and taking a look. And that's a significant difference. So again, it was what we promised people, it's what people wanted, and it's what we delivered. And I think that's important. I remember a statement somebody made, oh, probably about the time of Measure A, talking in general about tax measures, and said that so many of them, they keep coming back asking for money, but they never seem to get their house in order. And that stuck with me, because I do feel, as a citizen who pays for these things, at times, some revenue measures, I do see that. And I vote accordingly over the years. But in our case, we've actually done what was promised. And more importantly, I think Mr. G's actually been given the chance to prove and that it works. Uh, and I think the community sees that. So the real question is simply, yeah, this is a difficult time. That's for sure. But do we want it to continue? And, and I think that people will want that to continue because if not, we have to go back to 2010, and that was a very, very bad place. Uh, it isn't just all the incredibly negative repercussions that the city manager was talking about, but the logical conclusion of all those within a couple of years, where there were legitimate plans and discussion of eliminating local police, talk of Rohnert Park, potentially annexing, annexing Katati, something that Councilmember McKenzie from Rohnert Park has continued to talk of every chance he gets since then. Or, just as worrisome, us becoming a county-controlled unincorporated area. Unincorporated area. This, this is something nobody wanted to see happen. Um, you know, we have seen a lot lost lately due to this pandemic, and we'll see more fallout from this in the next year or so until this resolves. And I, I think the question is, do we, are we willing and do we feel it's necessary to let the whole city loss be lost for just a cent on the dollar, something we've been paying for years and we've now found, frankly, there's no impact whatsoever. And I say these things not as an alarmist, as a simple fact. And I, I'm going to close by agreeing with my friend John DeLasso. Tonight we're just being asked to give the public the opportunity to make this decision, and I certainly wouldn't stand in the way of that. I think in my years in public service, I've only once seen somebody stand in the way, in this town at least, of the public having a chance to vote in something this important. And that person was removed from office very quickly. 
So uh, that won't be a direction I'll be going tonight. Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Okay, thank you. Um, and I see uh, Vice Mayor Moore. Do you want to go ahead, please? Thank you, Mayor Skillman. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, to, to talk about this, and I would certainly agree with uh, my fellow council members, Tolosa and Landman. Um, it's really simple. We've been able to survive and actually improve our infrastructure due to this sales tax, this 1%. Um, if we don't maintain this or renew this, um, then we'll just go backwards. We won't continue to go forward like we've been doing. We've gotten praise and accolades from for our finance department in the way that we've been able to budget. We've been able to have some reserves. And we're moving forward, and I think it's something that we have to look at. Um, timing in, in light of a pandemic, maybe not the best, but if this were to be successful and it were to renew, then we would be able to budget out even further with more stability down the road and to maintain and continue to improve the city that many of the citizens would like us to do. So I, I uh, fully support this. Thank you. Thank you. And I yes. see uh, Council Member yes. Harvey, you have your hand up as well. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, the, there was just two points. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I just wanted to clarify two points. One, there was a question of why now? You know, why not next year? It was pointed, pointed out in the presentation, but obviously um, it, it wasn't clear. Uh, this measure needs to be put on the ballot where there are candidates in a general election or, um, you know, a November election. It, it, unless there is a special circumstance like we had once before where we had a fiscal emergency, other than that, it has to be put on a general election. So that is why it's this year, because if we don't do it this year, it can't be done next year. We would have to wait until 2022, which might be too late um, if there's a problem. The other thing, um, uh, there was talk about our infrastructure and how we've um, you know, really invested in that. But the other thing is, is we've really been able to strengthen our reserves, um, even with um, the pandemic and the things that are going on. Um, we've been able to maintain our reserves, and we've worked very hard to increase those reserves and to keep them where they need to be. And in the very beginning, we didn't have reserves. I mean, if you go back, um, enough years into like 2008, 2009, we didn't have anything. So it's really important that, that we have that rainy day fund to be able to weather these storms. Because I have to tell you that 2010 was not pretty. And um, I hope that we as a city never have to go there again. And I know some people say, oh, well, just let, let Bernard Park take care of us or, or revert to the county. Um, if you will look around, there are some cities that have gone with the county, and what they're having to do is they're having to further reduce services because the county is not that cheap. So, you know, you may have an officer that may come at some point, but we will not have a 24-7 um, set of police officers here at all time. You may have someone that is in Santa Rosa that may come down here for a call, but that's it. So it's just something to keep in mind. We have looked at that, and they are not uh, necessarily the most cost-effective um, means for having police services. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you. And I see, I don't know, if Vice Mayor Moore, did you have something else to add? I saw your hand go back up. I did. There was a couple other things I wanted to reference, and I did not get to them. Um, okay, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor Scumman. Um, as far as I know, and, and this has been going on since the original measure of a half a percent and then the renewal of that at one percent 
I am not aware of any business throughout the whole city or any individual citizen that has moved out of Katati because of a half a percent or a one percent sales tax. So uh, I don't know that that's really uh, a strain on the businesses here. And then secondly, I would never take away the ability of the citizens of the community to vote. Um, because as we know, that's, that's, that happened previously. And that, uh, you know, it's the citizens' right to vote on this. And uh, I'm all supportive of that. So thank you very much. OK, thank you. And. Um I would go through my comments, but I think they've all actually been very well verbalized by everybody. Um, oh, Councilmember DeLasso, I see your hand up. Do you have another comment or? No, no Mayor, I was just, when uh, you were finished with your comments, I'm happy to make a motion. Oh, okay, terrific. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna say, I don't wanna reiterate what anybody else has said. Um, and uh, I, I think one of the most important things is to um, maintain the ability to control where the money goes and the fact that it stays within our city limits. And uh, very important always to give the citizens uh, the right to be heard and to uh, be heard through their voting. So with that, I will let uh, Councilmember DeLasso make your vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to adopt a resolution placing a proposed ordinance on the ballot for November 3rd, 2020, to extend our existing local revenue measure known as Measure G. And this is Council Member Landon. I will second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can you please take a roll call vote? Our city clerk. Council Member DeLosso. Yes. Council Member Harvey. Yes. Council Member Landon. Yes. Vice Mayor Moore. Yes. Mayor Stillman. Yes. All right, thank you very much for all of your input and comments. And uh, with that, we will move on to item 12, our city manager's report. And for that, again, I will turn it over to city manager, Dean Yenobin. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, so a fairly quick report, just want to give you an update on some infrastructure work that's going on. Um, so bids were open today for the, the 2020 street paving project. And um, as we've been seeing recently, bids were very favorable, so that's good news. Um, they came in roughly $300,000 under the engineer's estimate for the uh, street paving. This is for the, uh, the paving of the named streets. So um, basically the ring, you know, Arthur, Henry, William, uh, Charles, and so forth, so pull off. So that, that's, what's, um, that's what's in the bid and also part of Battle Paraiso, the part between West Sierra and Potty Creek, the particularly um, degraded part right there. So um, staff is reviewing the uh, the revenue forecast, and we're going to be bring some, we're gonna bring something back to council on August 11th with a recommendation. Um, and, uh, and then the second half of that project, the original project, would include La Plaza and West Sierra Avenue. And so we're finishing the design on that as well and um, basically getting it ready for bid. Um, if there's, if there happens to be federal infrastructure money coming down um, in springtime, we'd be ready for that, essentially if trouble ready, um, or any other types of um, grant type of funding that might be available. In any case, it's, um, it's gonna be queued up here shortly for, um, for the next paving work. And then um, projects that are wrapping up, the wayfinding sign projects um, are, um, are wrap, that's wrapping up. The funnel walkthrough has happened, so they're going through punch list um, items right now. And um, we're also uh, we're also working on uh, phase two bidding for the project. And these are um, phase two of the wayfinding program. Is the uh, primarily like the informational kiosks um, and, and those types of um, those types of improvements. So not the uh, the first phase, as you know, was the uh, the signage, directional signage throughout the city, as well as you know, bollards and creek trails and those sort of things. Um, the second phase are the informational kiosks in the downtown area, and um, I believe it also includes um, some park monument signage as well. The uh, Floody Ranch House and Water Tower improvements are now substantially complete. 
and there's a final walkthrough tomorrow. Um, as if you've been uh, if you've been watching it get reconstructed, the um, the house main house received a new roof, um, perimeter paneling, interior and exterior paint, um, and some relocation of some internal walls and doorways to make it um, not so chopped up and more usable um, for for uh, whatever programming we move forward on in there. Um, the old water tower was replaced by a brand new structure. It has the same dimensions as the original, but um, much more functional, including a ground floor ADA accessible restroom, um, an office in the middle floor, attic space, and um, utility closet and outdoor sink for uh, hand washing. So if you have um, educational programming or classrooms out there, um, obviously outdoor you know, um, hygiene is important. So the sink and the restroom and all those facilities were added. Um, the driveway was also widened and regraded and some internal fencing relocated to make room for um, sort of event space that, um, that may be held there in the future. And then the uh, William and Olaf Street sewer replacement project is on track to be completed by the end of next week. Um, if you, you know, the trenching is basically you know, basically complete. We're almost, they started down at um, Old Redwood Highway and William Street and they're right now at Olaf West Sierra, so they're getting close to, uh, to finishing the trenching and tying in, and then uh, you know sw uh, switching over the sewer line to uh, from the old line to the new line and connecting the laterals for all the properties along along the alignment there. And um, this project corrects existing sewer capacity deficiencies as well as providing some capacity for um, planned future general plan growth. And then um, projects getting started. Finally, just construction began yesterday for the West School Street Pathway project. And the project is uh, projected to extend through the month of August, at which point it should be, it should be completed. And um, so for tonight, I will just leave it at that. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. All right, thank you for the report. And I see uh, Councilmember DeLasso has a hand up. Do you have a question for? City manager? I know. I don't, I don't think you're going to call on me again next meeting because I just got too many questions tonight. Sorry about that, Mayor. Um, Damien, I have just a, it's a, it's a follow-up question, but I didn't do enough homework on my end, so I apologize. But there's a wayfinding sign over by Pocket Park near the bridge path where the, the concrete walkway, um, one goes onto the bridge platform but the concrete walkway that goes down to uh, the trail that then goes to Benson. And there's a directional question that I had. I was looking at which direction it, the sign was pointing north, and it seemed to be due east to me. So it could be completely out of whack, and, and I've been suggested that's been my problem over the years, but I, I think there are Mistakes and um, follow up. Um, I will try to go over there. Just want to, to let you know. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we're um, we are going through the punch list items and correcting any sort of deficiencies we noted. So it's good to hear about anything that you guys see because. Um, Certainly, we'll make sure we put it in our punch list items and make sure it's right before they, the contractor demobilizes. Okay, and I'm not seeing any more hands going up with questions, so thank you for that report. And uh, we'll move on to item 13, which is City Council members' reports. Um, so I will check in. Uh, Council Member Landman, do you have anything to report out this week? Yeah, just one very small short thing. Uh, I think this might be helpful, at least for Mr. Scott, from our, for our Public Works Director. And it has to do with our last meeting of the Russian River Watershed Association, which was last Thursday. Uh, at that, we completed and approved uh, some guidelines for the technical working group. Uh, the technical working group at the RWA is composed of staff members from all the cities and county people, from the two counties that actually fall within the watershed and are members of the RWA. And this was done just we recognize for years we worked fine, but we continue to get new people that come and go, and sometimes there's a lot of questions. And it was recognized that having guidelines for what exact the responsibilities and the roles are for people on that group 
it's something we should have and it would be helpful. So we do have these now. So as we get newer staff members, I know we have a newer staff member from Rona Park that just joined. We're hoping this will be value for them. So I just wanted to share that tonight. Other than that, uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that very concise report. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, oh, okay, Councilmember Harvey, do you have anything to report out this week? Um, I attended the um, Waste Management Agency meeting the day after our last council meeting, and the only significant thing to report um, is there was a very lively discussion around the um, household hazardous waste, and we have been trying for some time to um, find a location to have a more northerly uh, facility because the people in Petaluma and Katati use the one at um, the central landfill a lot, but um, the farther north you get, um, it gets less and less use. So we've been trying to attempt to site another um, place for that, but um, we are finding that it's extremely expensive. It could be anywhere between $4 million and $10 million, which is a lot. Um, so we were looking at some other possible options and staff is going to be um, bringing those back to us. So some of it might include um, expanding the household hazardous waste collection events. Um, you know, right now we do up to 25 a year and maybe we could double that and, and pick up um, you know, some more of that. The other um, thing that um, some others are doing in other um, communities are having mobile household hazardous waste facilities, which basically means that rather than having just an event, um, the facility, if you will, which is typically a you know tractor trailer, um, is there for say three days. So it it's more effective for people in the community because what happens with just the one day event is just like, oh, I didn't hear about it, it's too late. So that's the other thing um, which would be relatively inexpensive for us to do, um, but um, could be more beneficial to people in some of the areas. So we'll hear more about that, but just wanted to report back that uh, we're still working on that. Because uh, we have to really work harder at getting more of this household hazardous waste um, so that it's not ending up on the sides of our roads and things. So that's all I have to report. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that report. And um, Council Member DeLasso, go ahead. You know, I warned you not to call on me again, but you took the bait. Um, the only thing about was uh, a meeting that Bill was on a call last week, and people um, uh, called him in, and we had very constructive uh, comments and discussion and questions from 10 or 11 different individuals. So um, I, I also wanted to thank Chief Parrish for not only the information he provided before the meeting uh, electronically on the website, but uh, the presentation that he gave, I heard from a number of people that called in, at least five or six anyway, uh, that called in that evening that they really appreciated uh, the presentation that he gave. So um, that's all I had to report out. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Vice Mayor Moore, go ahead. Thank you, Mary Skillman. Um, there was a couple of things. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of the other information that came about from the mayors and council members meeting and some of the things that they're bantering about. Um, as an example, the city of uh, Santa Rosa is considering contracting out for COVID test testing. Um, Mayor Sweden was, was talking that they were going to bring that back to their city council meeting. and. Petaluma has been doing some testing on their own down there as well. Um, more on those to come and, and what the results and the cost of those are. Uh, I don't know, but I 
can't imagine it's something that we're in a position to do at this point, but uh, it's interesting to know what some of the other cities are doing, and based on the population size, uh, the apparent necessity for that. Um, they also talked about, and you may have read about this in the paper recently, the, um, the suspension of the uh, drinking in public ordinances in the various cities. I believe Healdsburg and Windsor are allowing open containers from the uh, restaurants and bars and they can go sit outside and even away from the front of the location into the parks and things like that. Um, it's fairly new. I don't know how the results of that are or uh, what the data is on that yet, but I don't know if that's something that we might want to consider down the road, uh, if that's something that makes sense for us, um, that, that discussion may come up. And, uh, and then lastly, we also had a REMIF meeting, and that was a closed session meeting, so I don't have anything to report out on that, although I would like to see some of our uh, participating neighboring communities run their um, public safety departments as well as we run ours. That would be great. So thank you. That's all I have to report out. Okay, thank you for that report out. And uh, the only thing I have to add, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in addition to our weekly mayor's meetings that we were talking about earlier, um, I'm excited to hear that the library advisory board is uh, getting ready to do its first Zoom meeting, so I'll be participating in that, and that's in a couple of weeks. Um, so just happy to have some return to a little bit of normalcy, even though it will be by Zoom, so it's the new normal. And uh, that's all I have to report out. So with that, we'll move on to item 14, public comments on non-action agenda items. And I will ask our city clerk, Ken, to check in with our attendees. Thank you. Madam Mayor, if I may interrupt you for just a second. I'm sorry, oh. I forgot. I had one other item on my uh, report out. Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vice uh, Mayor. Just, just for the public information, there is a leadership council meeting for uh, regarding a community development commission in the county on um, August 2nd. And I don't have the time, but I'm sure it's on the county website. So I just thought I'd pass it along. Thank you. No, thank you for the information. Okay, with that, we'll turn to public comment on non-action agenda items, and I'll ask a city clerk to check in with the attendees at this point. Thank you, Mayor Spillman. And at this time, I see no raised hands. Oh. Mr. Bears, go ahead. Thank you, Council. It's former City Councilman Derich. Uh, I'd like to make some corrections, if I may. City Manager has said more than one time now that we can't repair or replace our streets and roads in Katati at the rate that they are deteriorating. That's a fact. And not one City Council member has ever disputed that fact or taken Mr bid on regarding his analysis and his street surveys. Two, no sunset on Measure G is basically a tax extension. That's what it means. And it's a break of your solemn promise, along with Bob Coleman, if I remember right, a solemn promise that the, the, the measure would sunset and give the community a break, a breather. Now, we all know who has hurt the most with the sales tax increase? Come on, kids. The poor. Google it. The people who are hurt the most with sales tax increases are the poor. They're often kept captive in a town because of lack of transportation and other things. Mr. Deloso has said, well, there has been some level of purchases in Katati from people that I know. Well, la di da. Isn't that heartwarming? Doesn't that give us a whole lot of reassurances that we have some level of purchases in Katadi? Now, you folks have driven sales out of Katadi over the last 10 years. The extra money that came in through Measure G will never replace the amount of sales tax dollars that went out of here because people were disgusted at paying the highest sales tax rate in the county. You are not giving anybody an opportunity 
other than to believe that you're going to lie to them again with all your propaganda that you're going to come up with to sell this sales tax increase to the public again. You're going to lie. You're going to pull out all the stops. And you're going to do it again. You're going to make promises that you cannot and will not keep. Now, more and more people are saying, let Katati fail. Yes, Mr. Lamb, and you are hearing right. People are saying that. Let it go to disincorporate. Let it merge with Rona Park. We're all hearing it. And that's on you, sir, and the council. You have failed. You guys don't understand basic economics. You can't leave. Katati is moving backwards, Mr. Moore. By any measure, it's been moving backwards. Only one, me one member of the city council voted against the huge sales tax increase measure A. And that was me, because one person understood basic economics, one person who has a college degree, and one person on, uh, on the council actually ran a real business in Katati. Katati had no reserves in 2008, because they were wasted. They wasted money for years. We had no reserves in 2008. We were not disciplined to save any money back then. That's what happened to us, Mrs. Harvey, and you were there to see it. You should be claiming. Mr. You should be claiming. Time is over. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Alderman, go ahead. Um, you really all disappointed me this evening. Um, I knew there was no chance of actually you listening. You didn't deal with why it has to be a um, it has to be a non-ending. It why it doesn't sunset. Why you have to put it on? Really, why it can't wait to 2022? All you've done is shown how dysfunctional you are. How it's been. It would have taken a miracle. Um, the last time that something did not pass this council was Mar no, sorry, April 2009, over 11, oh, 11 years ago. I had hope that maybe for once you might do the right thing, but of course you can't. You'll just keep up your 99% unanimous vote record tonight, which you have done for the last nine years. Um, when is things going to change? We really don't have a voice here in the city. We're not listened to. Um, it's, it's, you're going to get this trounced. Look at the comments on the press Democrat and on next door. Nobody wants any new taxes this November. And I do not appreciate that you all, especially Mark Lamon, but also other ones, you attacked George rather than deal with the door, the it, incident. This is another theme. This all needs to end. This back and forth over on this feud rather than dealing with, it's like, sorry, it's like dealing with two-year-olds. You guys made it into um, let's just fight, fight among ourselves rather than dealing with what the real issue was here. You proved how dysfunctional you are once again, and that's my comment. Here's Gilman, back to you. All right, thank you. And we'll move on to item 15. And I'll just check in with our city clerk. Was there any information received after the agenda was posted? I'd seen there was an email that was included in our uh, public comments. Was there anything else? Nothing further. Okay, terrific. And with that, um, we will adjourn this meeting at 8.49 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Please stay safe and practice all of those good habits we're supposed to be getting into masks and six feet away. All right, take care, everybody. Have a good night. Good night.